Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, I know I mentioned this the other day, but after over a year of no live music, I'm quite excited that I've booked tickets for the Why Not Festival. Camping in a field, seeing Stereophonics perform Dakota with a cold cider. Man, that sounds like heaven right now. (laughs) But what are you most looking forward to as the world opens back up? Please let me know. Email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. But right now, I wanted to share an inspirational story about how an engineer turned founder called Kathy Hanoon created Dandelion, a Google X spin-out where Kathy previously worked. And, and she has successfully built a renewable energy solution that could be used in any home and is the nation's largest residential geothermal company. And Kathy has also notably fundraised multiple rounds of funding while pregnant, not once, but twice, totaling $16 million. So I want to talk about all that, learn more about Kathy's story and the impact and interest for her company as investable trends are percolating around decarbonising the economy and the incoming administration's focus on sustainable energy and fighting climate change. So Kathy has an amazing story to share, so buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to New York, where Kathy's waiting to speak with us now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. My name is Kathy Hanoon. I'm the co-founder and president of a startup called Dandelion Energy. And what Dandelion really aims to do is make geothermal heating and cooling systems for homes. So these are systems that renewably heat and cool homes affordable. So the most a cost-effective way to heat and cool your home, but also very simple. So just super easy to get them installed. They're already very easy to run. Um, And we think by doing that, we'll be able to really accelerate the transition from fossil-fueled heating to renewable heating, which is something we absolutely need to do. Absolutely. And you've been on an incredible journey in technology, quite an inspiring career, and where you're heading is inspirational too. But before we take a dive into that, I've got to ask, Where did your love of technology come from? Can you remember the spark that put you on this path that you're on today? Well, I think even before I would have called it my love of technology, I certainly had a love of science. And one, I think, often leads to the other. But just the it's so empowering, right, to understand how something works and then thereby figure out how you can influence how how it works or how something happens. And I think um, I think that interest that's very general and vague translated into a love of technology specifically probably when I was in college. Um, I was really lucky and I got to go to Stanford University in Silicon Valley. And so I was just like in the heart of the technology world uh, for those sort of formative years. And um, I got to see all around me how, how entrepreneurs and scientists and Others were taking this understanding of science and technology and using it to do things that really influenced the course of events in the world. So I, I was really inspired to figure out how to get how to be part of that. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. And of course, here in 2021, Dandelion, which is a Google X spin out where you previously worked, has successfully built a renewable energy solution that could be used in any home and is the nation's largest residential geothermal company. But for people hearing about you guys for the first time, can you just set the scene and tell me a little bit more about the story behind Dandelion and also the problem that you set out to solve? Absolutely. So the problem that Dandelion is setting out to solve, and then I'll transition into sort of the story behind the company itself, is that millions and millions of homeowners, uh, we're focused in the United States, but this is true globally, are using fossil fuels to heat their homes today. So, um, you know, this includes natural gas, fuel oil, and propane mostly. And um, it's not just a small amount of emissions coming from all this heating that's going on, actually. In the northeast of the U.S., for example, where Dandelion is based, 
it's the second largest source of emissions after transportation. So transportation emits the most carbon, second is heating buildings. And I think while there's been a lot of attention from all the major companies in the automotive space to solving the transportation problem, moving to electric vehicles, there's been relatively little attention paid to how we're going to get rid of all those emissions coming from heating. And so while I was at X, my job was to find new business opportunities for X, new moonshot opportunities, um, we called them. And, And I think like when you look at the problem of getting rid of the carbon emissions in heating, these systems called heat pumps, they stand out as being the most obvious, clear-cut sort of solution to this problem. But even though heat pumps, you know, they're emissions-free, they're very efficient, they already exist. Like they, they're they actually pretty ubiquitous. Your air conditioner is an, an example of a heat pump, as is your refrigerator. Um, heat pumps for heating and cooling buildings weren't as popular as, I mean, some people have them, but they're just not that popular as you would expect them to be given all their benefits. And so a lot of the early work at X is just really trying to understand why, why are these systems that seem to have so much promise and so many benefits not really being adopted at that great a scale, especially in the United States. Um, And so what we found was a few things. One is um, they aren't, uh, that good at applications where it gets very, very cold in the winter. Uh, this is air source heat pumps. So the most common type of heat pump is called an air source heat pump. It's basically an air conditioner that can run in reverse. So it can do cooling, but also heating. They're great for mild climates, not as good for really cold places. Um, there are some companies that are creating air source heat pumps that are designed to work in cold places. So the technology is getting pushed in that direction, but it's still not quite there. And those coldest climate heat pumps can be very expensive. Then there's this other type of heat pump called geothermal heat pumps. And these get around that problem of really cold outside air by instead of exchanging heat with the air, they exchange heat with the earth, which just stays at a steady temperature year round. So it's much easier to make a heat pump that can heat a house well and cool a house well while it's connected to the ground because the ground just provides a very um, stable source of heat. But um, geothermal heat pumps, they were very expensive to install. And it wasn't even clear, even if you had the money, how you would go about it as a homeowner because there were no companies really set up to exclusively install geothermal heat pumps and homeowners often had to like really act as a general contractor to get them installed and quality was often a problem. So we see this uh, promise in heat pumps, but also an industry that's very fragmented, very difficult for a customer to navigate and very expensive. So it was clear that um, the challenge to make heat pumps more mainstream would really be, can we solve some of those issues that are holding these systems back and make them really easy and simple to install, but also very cost effective. And talking about making it easy to install, do you have any use cases you can share that just help anyone listening, no matter where they are in the world, understand the kind of difference that you're making with this technology and also bring to life what we're talking about here? Yeah. Yeah. So if, you know, if uh, in the, so before Dandelion, what it would take to install a geothermal heat pump, you would have to do some research, see like, is there anyone in your area that even installs geothermal heat pumps? And the answer might be no, you know, it might be (laughs) yes, but it very might, might be no. And then if you did find a company that could do it, um, often that company wouldn't install exclusively geothermal. It'd be like a HVAC company that could do it along with many other things, but maybe they did it pretty infrequently. So you'd be, um, there's no, like a, a lot of times you'd be presented with a contract that didn't have a set price. Like what we saw often was I would say, look, yeah, I'm, I'm a contractor. I can install this for you, but I don't know how hard it will be to install the ground loops in your yard. So we'll see. And then I'll just charge you based on how hard it ends up being. Right. And for a lot of homeowners, that's not going to work. And then even if um, you did agree the prices were just extremely high. We're talking like sixty to one hundred thousand dollars for a single-family home, because um, 
because it's such a niche product that's often sold into a luxury market. So we did a few things to try to, to try to um, make this easier. One is as dandelion, we just handle, we do exclusively geothermal heat pumps for single family homes. We handle the full process. So we'll, we have a set price up front that's the same for every, you know, person in your area that needs a certain size system. So there's no like negotiation or trying to figure out if you're getting a good deal. We just have a price. And then we take on the risk of maybe your geothermal ground loops are hard to install. Well, we've committed that we're going to do it. So we've taken on that risk for you. You don't have to bear it as the homeowner. We also have invested in smaller drilling equipment that's more um, purpose-built for yards in residential areas. So uh, our drilling equipment makes less of a mess in the yard. It's it's smaller, so it can just fit in more places. And um, we've also invested in creating a, geotherm- a geothermal heat pump, which is the thing that sits in your basement, typically where your furnace used to be that has monitoring. So you as the homeowner can tell it's performing well and it's um, designed to just be much more cost-effective. So we've, we have a more direct to consumer model. We've really designed it with cost-effectiveness, durability and performance in mind. Um, And we'll do the design, the installation. And then if you want the service of that unit, so it's like as a homeowner, you don't have to be an expert in geothermal. You can just sign up, get a price, and then decide to move forward and we'll take care of it. So that was important to me just to make it easy for homeowners and and also obviously cost-effective, right? Being able to offer it at a price where people actually save money and are financially better off using geothermal versus fuel oil, for example, because we knew that if we could align the homeowner's financial incentive with the sort of better thing for the environment, then that's the only way we were going to have the impact that we wanted to have. And it's incredibly impressive what you've created here. But something else I want to to share with everyone listening is I believe, Kathy, that you fundraised multiple rounds of funding while being pregnant, not once, but twice, totaling $16 million. Can you tell me more about your experiences around that period? Yeah, um, I started dandelion in the spring of 2017 and my daughter was born just under a year later in the early Mm. spring of 2018 and i think it's um you know i as i was trying to decide like i had been planning like i wanted to have children at that time i didn't necessarily expect i'd be starting a company at that Mm. time and I had to ask myself, like, do I still want to move forward with having this? Like, do I still want to pursue this? Because obviously both activities are a ton of work and a huge commitment. And ultimately I made the decision, obviously, that I did want to continue um, and to have to start my family just because I think I was aware even then that you know, I hoped that Dandelion would last for a long time and that I'd be deeply engaged in it for a long time. And so it was never going to feel easier, right? Like there was no, I knew there was never going to be a moment where I was like, okay, I'm free now. Like I can go ahead and have my kids now. And I think a lot of women feel that way. It's just like, you know, life isn't really like that where you find yourself all of a sudden with nothing to do. And you're like, oh, this is the perfect time to have a kid. I mean, I'm sure it happens that way for a few lucky people, but for many of us, it doesn't. Um, and fundraising while pregnant, I'm not going to lie, was really difficult. So it was difficult because I am not, was not, I guess, was not an experienced fundraiser at all. So it was that learning curve of trying to even figure out how you pitch something and like mm-hmm. what is an effective uh, way to fundraise. And I was aware of my identity as a female founder and there's so much media coverage about how hard it is to raise money as a woman. And so that was already sort of in my subconscious, but then to be pregnant, it was like, what, how could I more emphasize my identity as a young woman than that? Right. So I had this, um, 
my biology was such that I didn't really look pregnant um, until the very end. So I actually don't think a lot of VCs that I was pitching to could tell I was pregnant. And I think that was an advantage perhaps that I had that many do not in the sense that it was in my control for a lot of the process, how to disclose or whether to disclose. Whereas I think a lot of pregnant women, it's like pretty obvious. You can't really, (laughs) you know, you can't really hide it. So that was kind of unique. And then the second time I was pregnant, I was a slightly more experienced fundraiser, but I was also very early on in the pregnancy so much so that it was like, I wasn't even really telling my friends yet. So I certainly wasn't telling uh, just, you know, these strangers that I was just meeting and asking for money. But um, yeah, the second time was a bit easier. Love that. And we will have startup founders listening all over the world. And for those that are at different stages of their journey, can you share your struggles and growth as a founder and how your passion for essentially building a solution that cuts 70% of homes carbon footprint also helped you fuel your future success? And apologies for the pun there, but I had to put that in. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think one of the struggles for me, I would say, um, from the beginning as a founder and as a CEO at the beginning was just like, I'm somebody who can, I I think a strength that I have sometimes is I can see a lot of different perspectives and I have a lot of empathy for different perspectives, but that was difficult sometimes in my role as founder and CEO, because if one of my reports wasn't working out very well or somebody disagreed with my point of view on something, my instinct is to like really deeply consider, do they have a point? Is there like, what about what they're saying is true? I should be better, right? Like I, I often will um, default to that. And I think as a leader, that is actually a, a good thing. Like I've come to see that as a good thing because it is nice to have leaders that care about like their team and their team's experience and opinions and, you know, will listen, but it was also super exhausting and hard. I wasn't balanced with it at the beginning. It was like, I, um, I've had to learn how to build, build on that. So it's like, yes, okay. That's a good foundation, but also um, you know, as a CEO, like your job is to set the direction. And ultimately you do sometimes have to make hard decisions and you don't always know what's right. And you don't have full information and that's the job. And like, sometimes people are just in the wrong role and the solution isn't to manage them better. Sometimes like that's never going to work and you just have to like make a change and it's, it's not personal. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think I really had to develop, um, more of that comfort around being okay with discord and like people's feelings sometimes getting hurt and just like balancing it, um, with the empathy side. And it's been helpful to see other leaders, some, some of whom that I get to work with seem to have no qualms about those, uh, aspects of leadership, which I don't know, I don't necessarily ever need to emulate that all the way, but it's been powerful for me to see those examples and contrast them with my style and sort of figure out what I keep and then what I want to grow into. Love that. And I think that the tech industry as a whole does have a bit of a reputation and a problem with diversity. We've all seen the headlines. I think there's progress being made, but there is still so much work that needs to be done in that area. But can I ask that you share your experience and indeed your perspective as an entrepreneur, a woman in tech and a parent startup founder struggling a a work-life balance and a global pandemic? It's just a mountain to climb when you write it all down like that. But is there any advice that you would offer to other founders listening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that served me really well in my career, both with Dandelion and also before Dandelion is, um, just going after things that seemed potentially too challenging for me, you know, like I, um, I guess one example of this is when I was working at Google, I applied for and then was surprised actually to get accepted to a master's degree program at Stanford for computer science. And 
I thought, you know, this will, de- I, I decided to pursue it part-time. So I pursued my master's degree while I was working full-time. I knew that would be very difficult. I didn't know if I could do it. And I almost didn't, I almost, re- I almost had the thought pattern of like, mm, that seems really hard. I don't know how I'm going to do that. Maybe I just won't do it. But then I was just like, it was such a gift to have been accepted into the program that I just decided, you know, well, let's see, I'm just going to try. And then like, you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but like, why not try? So then it was really hard, but I ended up doing it. Um, And it really helped me. Like I got some opportunities in my career. I wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't done it. And I think with Dandelion too, it was like, "Mm, I don't know how to start a company. There's a lot you have to know. I don't, I don't know any of it. It seems really hard. Like it could go really badly. So I, I was tempted not to do it right. To stay in my comfort zone at Google. Um, but obviously I did it cause I just knew I wanted to be the type of person who would pursue such an opportunity as I had before me. So I forced myself to do it and like somehow pulled through and <laughs> like, I'm still here talking to you four years later. Um, and the company is doing well and it was not a straight path or easy. And there were times when I thought it would all be for nothing. So not to minimize those challenges. I'm just, my advice would just be, even if, if there's an opportunity you're excited about, don't not do it. Cause it seems too hard. Like just try it. And what's the worst that could happen, right? Like if, if it doesn't work out, you're not really in a worse place than if you had just quit before you tried because you were worried it wouldn't work out, right? So I think that would be my overall advice. Fantastic advice and an incredible journey of being on there. And I'm curious, in this year though, how are the current investable trends around sustainability and decarb- decarbonizing the economy and fighting climate change, how are they impacting you at Dandelion? Because it, it, although it, it is a four-year overnight success story, you know, but it, it almost feels like you're in the right time at the right place right yeah. now. I agree. I think our timing, in retrospect, I think we were really lucky with our timing. Um, You know, in 2017, Trump was president. There wasn't a lot of enthusiasm around climate tech. Venture capitalists were not thrilled to be investing in the space in general. And fast forward four years, all of that has changed. And we have an administration who's very committed to climate. Policy is going in the right direction. And the investor community is following and sees the opportunity. And I think it's been amazing to see so many things like that change over such a short period of time. And I certainly feel very fortunate about the timing and how it's played out. Yeah, it seems that so much has changed in a short space of time. And in Silicon Valley, they've got they've moved from this almost move fast and break things ethos to more ethical technology and, and how we can make a difference. But what is it that excites you about the road ahead and how technology will continue to improve and protect this tiny planet that we both share? Well, I'm just excited that um, climate is an industry where I do think technology has so much to offer in the way of solutions. You know, there are so many big problems in this world where technology might not be the first tool you would go towards. It might be more of a political problem. There are lots of different tools to solve different types of problems. Technology is only one. And I think obviously we'll need policy in the climate climate solution set as well. But I do think technology has such an important role to play. And like one, one example of this that really struck me early on at Dandelion is when we started working in New York and started showing that we could install geothermal systems cost effectively and at a larger scale than had been done in the past, the state of New York um, saw that and it gave politicians in New York and leaders in New York confidence to put forth uh, more favorable policies for geothermal than we'd seen in the past because policymakers don't want to put policies in place that are impossible to like um, meet by the industry, right? Like if there's no industry there, it just doesn't make sense to put a policy in place. So it's really this amazing feedback loop. And then Connecticut looked at what New York was doing, saw the progress of geothermal, and then put their own incentives in place that reflected New York's. And now we've seen that actually happen in Vermont, Massachusetts, right? It's spreading. And so now I have this really 
strong appreciation for the relationship between technology advancement and policy advancement. It's um, the policymaker lays the groundwork for, you know, saying we encourage this this change in the world that we want to see. But then as a technologist or an entrepreneur, we have to meet that challenge and show, look, we're responding and we're making progress that you want us to make. And then we give confidence for further investment. It's been a nice um, feedback loop that I think has really enabled geothermal as a technology to get to gain a lot of strength in a short time. Love that. And a question I always ask every guest at the end of an episode is, is there a particular song or piece of music that has inspired them, whether they're trying to secure funding, going on stage to deliver a keynote and just want to get their head in the zone? Is there a particular song that stands out to you and, and why? For me, I think probably the Hamilton soundtrack <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely gets me in the right headspace because isn't that whole story about this like really committed, passionate group of people fighting yeah. to make a change that they really believe in and all of the like turmoil and heartbreak and victory <laughs> that goes along <laughs> with it. And would there be one song off that soundtrack that we can put maybe, on the playlist? Yeah. So many good ones, but maybe for the sake of this question, I'd say my shot. My shot. Love it. I will add that as soon as we finish recording. But before I let you go, for anyone listening who wants to find out more information about anything we've talked about today and find you online and contact your team if you've got any questions, what's the best starting point? Dandelionenergy.com. Excellent. Well, I'll add that link to the uh, blog post that will accompany this episode. So much I've loved chatting with you about today. It's such an important topic and a topic that involves each and every one of us. And on this planet, we're all going to have to learn to do more with less and think about our own responsibilities and our own footprint that we leave behind. But the fact that you're using technology to uh, on sustainability is just incredible. And not to mention your inspirational backstory too. But more than anything, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Wow. What an inspirational story and lovely person to speak with. I just love how Kathy is so transparent with her struggles and growth as a founder and her passion for allocating these precious years of her career and life to building a solution that cuts 70% of a home's carbon footprint. And I think we all want to leave some kind of legacy behind and make a difference with the short amount of time we've got on this planet. So kudos to Cathy for the amazing work she's done there. As an inspirational entrepreneur, woman in tech and parent startup founder straddling a work-life balance. These are the kind of stories I want to get on here. So consider this your true calling. I want you to email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. You can get me on social channels, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, etc. at Neil C. Hughes. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk where you'll find over 1,600 interviews of this podcast and also the shows I've hosted with Citrix and Netgear. But on that inspirational note, a big thank you to Cathy for sharing her story and an even bigger thank you to each and every one of you that tune into this podcast each and every day all over the world. You are all what makes this show what it is, you and your stories. And on that note, before I get all teary and sentimental on you all, I'll just say thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.